All right. I'll do my best to keep it tight today. There's plenty here to look at, so let's pray. Well, we just pray that your Spirit will be with us today, Lord, as we finish this series on the work of your Holy Spirit. Well, may we have some fresh understanding today and may these loose ends that we have be tied together. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so yes, good morning again. And that's what I'm seeking to do today is to tie some loose ends. Because uh, we could have finished it last week, back in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, finishing that section. But like I said, there's some unfinished business to attend to and there's some unanswered questions which are very important questions because they're questions that answer what our practice should be now in, in our church in the 21st century, in specifically Collie. And um, because it's, we're at the day towards the end of this church age, I believe we're fairly close to the end of the church age, and because um, there's a lot of things I've set up to now that might be interesting to know, but what, yeah, what does it mean for me today in Collie in 2018? You know, how can I use this? Should I expect God to prophesy through me or through anyone? Should I pray for healing for people? What about speaking in tongues? Is that for today? So I'm going to go through a few parts of the Bible this morning and try and show you what I think we need to understand about these things and, and why they're important. Now that we've seen these things about the Holy Spirit's work in and through his people, so, that, so we're going to build on every, all the previous 11 messages that we've had. And we're going to begin in Mark 16, because that gives us some key fundamentals to sort of work with as well. But before I get into it, I feel I'm obliged to briefly address the genuineness of this part of the Bible. Because most of us, if you've got your Bible there, I recommend you have it in front of you. Um, so between verses 8 and 9, yours probably says something about um, this is not in some of the early manuscripts or something like that, or it's not necessarily genuine. Now we've looked at, well I personally, sorry, I've looked at both sides of this argument pretty closely over the years and I've settled in my heart that this is genuine scripture. Now, to be honest, just so you know, that's at odds with most scholars today, just so you know, um, but I'm okay with that. And I'll just very quickly I'll just say there, there, well, there are arguments against it on grammatical grounds. So you know, it's the, way the words used aren't typical to Mark and that kind of thing. And on the fact that it seems to promote some pretty way out stuff like drinking poison and stuff. <laughs> but first, for me for, for personally, those arguments aren't convincing, especially when you see what the purpose for this section is, and which I hope to show you today. Uh, but the most convincing evidence for its genuineness I've found is in the work of a Russian-born scholar named Ivan Panin. I don't know how you know it, say Panin, Panin. He's kind of originally Russian, but he ended up American. That's where he lived. And Chuck Missler gives a good summary of that work. And you can see messages on YouTube about that if you want to follow up this stuff about Mark 16, 9 to 20 specifically. But the point is that there are patterns within the text itself that to me prove that God intends for us to include this portion of Mark in the canon of Scripture. If you leave it out, the patterns simply don't work. And it's not just for this bit, but for the Gospels as a whole. It kind of shows you that they're all one unit in a sense. And it's, I can't explain that this morning, but um, you could say it's God's stamp of authentication on, on his work and saying this is in and this isn't in. So... That's why I be, one of the many reasons I believe this is part of the scripture. And plus it teaches us some really valuable stuff if you want to actually get into the heart of what it's saying. So, so let's look at it. Now, as always, I start with context. So leading into this section, which we've, uh, we haven't looked at because this is now Mark, but it's the time immediately after Jesus' resurrection and what happened is there was general fear and disbelief in, amongst the disciples on hearing the news that he was alive again. They, they've heard that he was alive. These women came and said, he's alive. And, and they, what, really? Oh, that can't be right. There was disbelief and, and fear as well. So that sounds like someone stolen his body or something. So there's fear and disbelief. So that theme does link through both the accepted section of Mark and the disputed section. So that's to me, is a little bit more evidence that it belongs there. 
because we see uh, you know, the fear of the women in verse 8. That's in the accepted section. And then the disbelief of the disciples in verses 11 and 13. So there's that idea of distrust and fear going right through there. So in the atmosphere of all that doubt, Jesus deals with it in person. So we look at Mark 16, verse 14. So I'm starting at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. There's that link through from a whole lot there. Because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So firstly, why was it just 11 apostles? You can answer that. Jesus, yeah. Jesus already died the same day Jesus died, probably. So there's just 11 left of the 12. And it's important to know exactly who Jesus was talking to. So that's why it's there, I think. So was there anyone other than the apostles there? Well, we, we don't know, but we don't have any evidence that they were. And the way the Bible's written is that we, he, the Bible... Mark wants us to know that Jesus is speaking to the eleven at this point. That's, that's his target, specifically the apostles. So if that's what they looked like, then that would have been them. But I've got a feeling they're a bit younger than that. Because, you know, I think they had quite a lot of young guys in the, in the group. Anyway, so what was Jesus' mood when he saw them? He was a bit upset, wouldn't you say? He had to tell them off for their unbelief. So he came up to them and, listen, guys. So he, he told them numerous times before he died that he would die and rise again. And now that both had happened, they were still not convinced. So isn't that a bit like us sometimes? I keep reflecting on myself and going, how much evidence do we really need to be able to trust Jesus? Um, and to the unbeliever, you always need a bit more. For the un- well, person who just won't believe, you always need a bit more evidence. And Jesus has given us more than enough evidence. We just need to trust him with the evidence we do have. And that's why he had to appear to the 11 apostles now. So even though he shouldn't have had to, but nevertheless it was all in his plan the whole time because he had a message for them. Verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So this is like the condensed version of the Great Commission that you read in Matthew 28. And this is one reason that some like to doubt this passage, by the way. They say, oh, you know, people wanted to make a better ending to Mark. So Mark really finished verse 8. They wanted to make a better ending, so they just picked bits and pieces from the Bible, including Matthew 28, and just put it all together to make it sound better at the end. And, um, but if, you've been, if you look at Mark and Matthew, Mark has been following Matthew very closely the whole way through because Matthew and Mark have a lot of similar material in them. They're the most similar of the, of the Gospels. So it's not really surprising that that information is in there. But anyway, the point is that this is Jesus' time to tell them to stop moping. Say, so, hey, I'm right here. I'm alive and well. So get out there and tell people about me. That's what his message here is. Then Mark, and I believe it's Mark. I'll go ahead saying it is. So he starts to talk about the responses they will see. So verse 16 tells us that. It says, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now just incidentally, this is a favorite verse for those who believe in what we call baptismal regeneration, that you need to be baptized to be saved and go to heaven in water. And you can see that it's not true here, because what's the basis for being condemned in the second half of the verse? Not belief. Just just unbelief. It doesn't mention not baptism. So only unbelief. So the baptism listed there is simply evidence of belief, not the criteria for salvation. That's just want to make that point. Because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I think we've heard that said before. I've said it before, so and water baptism cannot save since it's a human work. But faith or belief is what brings you into Christ. If you're talking about being in Christ. That's what brings you in, into the family of God. And so it's spirit baptism that saves. That's the supernatural work of God. So when that happens in you, the the supernatural spirit of God coming to live in you, it'll make an external difference, won't it? It should do. Well, what kind? Well, here's what we have Jesus tell the 11 now, verse 17. This is applicable to them necessarily. 
And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, and they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hand on the sick and they will recover. Now, are these things typical of all believers today? No. So you don't see these, every one of these things happening on a regular basis all the time. It's certainly not um, in my, the circles I see anyway. And do you even see them sometimes? Some do. Certainly they claim they do. And, um, it's, but certainly I don't see anyone drinking poison. I don't think I've heard anyone ever say they drank poison. And a couple, there's some that say that they do. Yeah. Yeah. And the snake handlers. Yes. Yeah, so many claim to experience these things, and that's cool, but um, I don't. I haven't seen much evidence of the drinking poison thing, actually, physical, clear evidence. So um, that's not to say God can't do it if he wants, and he probably has. But is it, is it commonplace? No. That's why I'm, I'm actually glad drinking poison's on this list, because it's kind of that way out one. Because it actually tells us something, I believe. Now, some would say that it tells us that the majority of those in church are apostate and not real Christians, which is what those kind of groups would say, because they can't drink poison and not die, or heal everyone in sight, at whim. But that just doesn't make sense. Even, as in, it doesn't make sense that everyone's just not saved. Even though there are many who go to church that actually aren't saved, but even so, these don't happen completely predictably every time, even for those in churches who claim to have these things happening in their church. It's not every single time and completely perfectly. So what does make sense? Well, what I've come to, and you may differ, that's fine, but what I believe makes sense is that this was Jesus' word to the apostles specifically. It was never intended to apply beyond them. So let me explain that. Again, first keep in mind the context. Jesus had just told them off for their unbelief. So he was perhaps making a concession to them now, saying, hey, because you guys still need some signs that I'm with you, here are a few that, I'll, that will show you that I'm still working as I promised. So he gives them as, as signs to the, to the apostles there. And as well as that, these signs would authenticate the Holy Spirit's work through them to others as well. So they'd see these things happening and say, oh, this is something different going on here. This is special. Because it'd be showing that they are uh, especially unique as apostles, the ones who would become the foundation of the church, as Ephesians 2 verse 20 describes them. And the last verse of Mark tells us that these signs were to be for authentication. It says that, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So you see, these were to confirm the message, which was a new message to the world. So it's because it's new, you need some kind of um, a, you know, accompanying signs are, are helpful for that. So the miracles were there for authentication, to confirm the truth of what they, the apostles, taught. Now, just looking back to verse 17, no, what, notice what Jesus says there. These signs will accompany you guys. Is that what it says? No? These signs will accompany those who believe. So this tells me that these signs, while not happening every single time, would be demonstrable things that would happen to those who hear the apostles' message. Of course, the apostles would do these things themselves, and there's plenty of evidence of that in Acts and, and beyond. But this tells us that those who were converted directly by them would also see some of these signs. So if this is accurate, we should see the apostles and some of the first generation of believers doing these things. I think, that's, I think that's what it's saying. But there is no promise that there were the, these kind of things would continue beyond that time. So the question is then, is that what we see in Scripture? And the answer, in my opinion, is yes. So let me show you. So to do this, we need to jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, because there's a term there that we need to be familiar with. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, I'll bring it up, let's read it. Um, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. 
So the term there is signs of an apostle, or signs of a true apostle, because there were f- fake ones. Paul talks about super apostles later on in, in uh, 2 Corinthians there. So what are the signs of an apostle? Well, we have the list already, don't we? Mark 16, and I'll bring them up for us here. So I'll use the umbrella term signs and wonders for all of this. So I borrowed that from yeah, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12. And then on the list of those five elements from Mark 16, 17 to 18. So to cast out demons, also called exorcism. Speak in new tongues or new languages. Pick up snakes. Drink poison and not die. Healings. Now, these are all things that are done by the apostles themselves. You don't have examples of every single one, although Paul was bitten by a snake. But we don't have an example of drinking poison as such. Although there are anecdotal ones. And so these were things done by the apostles themselves and occasionally by those in the first generation of believers like specifically Stephen and Ananias. Um, They were listed as doing some miracles. They weren't actual apostles but they did miracles of different kinds. So you'll find pretty much every miracle that happens in Acts and all of the New Testament really fits into those five things but actually mostly into the last one into healings that's what most of those signs were that we see the only ones to comment on really extra are the raisings from the dead which for example Paul did in Acts 20 and that can can pretty much come under healing so we'll put that together it's just a really big healing (laughs) when you're dead and then there's the time that Paul called blindness down on a man called Elimas for his opposition to their work. So that's kind of like a healing in reverse as a judgment on Elimas. But really that list is about it for signs and wonders in the apostolic group. So okay, so th- these are the apostolic gifts which at times did spill over to those who believed their message. I think that's what Mark's telling us there. But I want to do something now to show you how we can see what matters to us now. So what if we take the list of gifts that Paul gives the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14? So what elements of that list are common with the ones in Mark 16? Because we've been going through all them and we've read them. So here they are. They're the two lists. Now, just to be totally transparent, so I'm not playing silly games, I'll let you know I've left off the gifts that are listed in Corinthians there of apostle, prophet and teacher because they're more correctly officers if you want to call them that so they belong to specific individuals those things apostles, prophets and teachers and therefore there's a slightly different category of gift and I'll deal with that in a moment but other than that the full list is shown everything that's listed in as gifts in Corinthians there and everything that's listed in Mark there in Mark 16 so what parts of the Mark list are in the Corinthian list? I'll bold it to make it obvious for you. So there's obviously gifts of healing and working of miracles, which kind of fits more with the umbrella term, signs and wonders there. And of course there's speaking in tongues, and therefore we need to include the gift of interpretation with that, because we saw over the last week, the last few weeks, they're, just, they're designed to go together of course, because tongues without interpretation is not allowed, and interpretation without tongues is obviously not necessary. It doesn't make sense. So they're, they're, they're a pair. All right, so why do I show you these lists? Well, if you believe what I'm trying to explain here, those things in bold are part of the sign gifts designed to establish the validity of the apostle's ministry, right? That's the signs of an apostle. But here's where we need to start to be really careful to be precise. And that's what you need to do to rightly divide the scriptures. Be careful and precise and trust that God's word's without error. That God's word is without error. That's one of the key things. That goes an awful long way to sorting out the detail when you trust that God's word is reliable. So as I like to say, harking back to my teacher days, put your thinking caps on and pay attention. And I need to say, uh, you need to be precise because there's something we need to revisit at this point that will help us with our foundation of understanding from, to work from, more of this foundation we need. And that's the verse I referred to earlier, Ephesians 2.20. So 
So I'll bring it up on the screen this time. I just referred to it before, but here it is. So it says uh, that the church as a whole is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So they've got a helpful little diagram up there, kind of the church, if you representing it as a building, comes up from the foundation. So what this tells us is there's something unique, something foundational in the offices of apostle and prophet. And you might say, as some do, capital A apostles and capital P prophets, since they have a formal role commissioned by God. Although the ESV there that we're using doesn't capitalise it, but many people think of it that way. So what that tells us is that the office of apostle, capital A, and prophet, capital P, is finished. And there are no more of them now. Because it stands to reason, really, because you don't keep laying a foundation once the rest of the building's begun, do you? No, once the foundation is there and it's been checked off and approved, it is the fixed reference point by which you construct the rest of the building. So that's the function of the apostles and prophets and their writings, of course. And it was in those apostles that these signs were invested. And it was through the prophets that we might call authoritative prophecy came. So what do I mean by authoritative prophecies? Well, I'm talking about those that carry the weight of Scripture, or are Scripture in many cases, because they became written into the New Testament. So they spoke, these prophets, with the inerrancy and authority of God himself as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, as Peter phrases it in 2 Peter 1.21. And this applied to both apostles and prophets, who were the ones who wrote our New Testament. Now, I say that, establish that foundation, literally, the foundation, to say this, that the gifts uniquely given to the apostles and prophets, namely, looking at them again, casting out demons, speaking in tongues, picking up snakes, drinking poison and healings, and then to the prophets, which is the deliverance of authoritative scripture level prophecies. The era of these gifts being invested within specific individuals has now ceased, has passed. Which is why, which would imply, sorry, that the rest of the 1 Corinthians list, so wisdom, knowledge, faith, distinguishing spirits, helping and administrating, are completely available to us for the asking. But as for the apostolic and prophetic gifts passing, let's be clear that I didn't say that would never happen again. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that the time when specific men were endowed with the ability to do these things at any time they chose is now over. The foundation has been laid and checked off by the boss, you could say. God, God's the boss, by the way. <laughs> he checked it off, said that's, that's set. So that means these gifts no longer need to fulfill the role they once did to authenticate the apostles and God's word spoken. So they faded out of relevance once the apostles and prophets died. Now we have their writings, the Bible, to be our reference. That's why God wants us to have that. So in that way, I'm personally a cessationist. I believe that the Bible shows that this era has passed. But... I'm a continuationist in some aspect as well. That's because, what I, that's because that's what I believe the Bible also teaches. Now I mean, that's what I mean, sorry, that probably confuses quite a few of you, those who are used to being one camp or the other. But hang with me and I'll do my best to show you what I mean because there's elements of both is what I think are good. Just goes to show sometimes why labels can be unhelpful. Sometimes, sometimes they are helpful as well but sometimes they can obscure things as well. So, as I've said before, the continuationist and cessationist are very blunt instruments. They're clumsy and they're often used as clubs to beat each other with, so, so we've got to really understand what, what's going on. So what we need to understand is the difference between the office of prophet and prophecies themselves. That's one distinction we need to make. Because all prophets prophesy... That's pretty straightforward. All prophets prophesy. But not all prophecies come from prophets. Confusing? No. All I'm saying is that normal people can prophesy too. They're not capital P prophets, but they can sometimes prophesy. And so for proof of that, let's head back to Acts 2. 
which is kind of our, our go-to section in much of this series, even though we've never really had it as a, as a reading as such, we just keep finding it's the central area to go to explain some things. So just while you're doing that, now I'm, if you're wondering why I'm going to this level of detail, trust me, this is what we need for the be able to apply the practical application in the end. So now you'll no doubt recall the speech Peter made at Pentecost in Acts 2, where he qu- quoted the words of Joel. That's in Acts 2, 17 to 18. So I'll bring that up. This is Peter speaking, quoting Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So even servants, men and women will all what? Prophesy. So Joel said that day was coming. And then Peter said that day is here. This is the inauguration of the church. Here is that first Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection. Now, of course, there was some overlap there with the capital P prophets, as we've just described, because they obviously were living still and they lived for a while yet, as of, as of this day, um, at Pentecost there. But Peter is showing that, that the ability to give prophecies will not finish with their death, because at any time anyone may be given the ability by God to prophesy. Now, these people won't be prophets as such, They won't have the office where they speak authoritative words of God. But there is the possibility that anyone, high, low, male or female, will have the potential to give a Holy Spirit-directed prophecy. Now, you don't have to agree, but hopefully you'll see my logic there at least. I'm trying to make sense of all these scriptures to put together. Because this is what we're doing. We're just putting all the scriptures. How does it fit? But there are people who disagree. And, And this is where someone like a preacher, John MacArthur, would take issue because guys like him would say that anyone, anytime someone claims to have a message from God, it is necessarily a claim to biblical level authority. But I would say that the difference, I'd say that I disagree with that, the difference is um, in that kind of revelation is that in this one, whether it's a prophecy that someone in your family is going to one day return to faith in Jesus before they die, <laughs> or even if it's just an impression in your spirit that you believe is from God, Either way, we must check it against the Bible. And if there is nothing in it that's contrary to the Word of God, we're free to simply move forward with that knowledge, trusting that it's from God. But always aware that our own weakness may distort what we've heard, or even the possibility that we've listened to the wrong voices, and be ready to correct if we need to. So that sort of makes a bit of sense about the difference in those kinds of prophecies. But God will make it plain in his time should that be necessary one way or the other. Because I think we all, we all I think if it's safe to say, we all have those impressions from God. And I think even John MacArthur would agree he has those impressions from God when he's writing his, working out what to preach next. Isn't he listening to God? Because it's not written in Scripture what to preach next. So, um, as in what, where, to, where to tackle the next book or whatever. So we all hear from God in our spirits, I believe. Because why wouldn't God communicate with his children in that way? Sure, the Bible is absolutely sufficient. I'm not undermining that at all. And if God never gave us those messages in our hearts, we'd still have enough in his word to believe in Jesus and make good choices. There's plenty there. But God loves his children. And sometimes he just wants to nudge us and show us he's right there with us. And sometimes just to give us a little pointer that we might need. To me, that's only logical. And sometimes we can even give a prophecy unawares. Like the way that Caiaphas, the high priest in Jesus' day, he did it. He said this in John 11. I'll just bring it up. You don't need to go there. John 11, 49 to 51. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. So Caiaphas, he had no idea what he was saying was prophetic. But it was because God decided to give that message through him. And so I'm sure that there are times when we say exactly what someone else needs to hear 
You know, those times when it's just the right words at just the right time, but we're completely unaware of it. We haven't planned it and we don't really realise that we're saying this thing that someone needs to hear. You know, it happens with strangers walking past to say something and someone goes, ding, you know. God uses anything. We can all think of examples like that, I'm sure. So the bottom line in this is that Scripture is utterly reliable as God's Word and it's utterly sufficient. But in no way should that, I believe, rule out God interacting like this with his children from time to time. The problem is when we take those impressions and prophecies and make them more of our focus than the Bible, which is something like what the people at Bethel Church, which are who I mentioned last week, often do to their own detriment. Because they take these impressions they get and they develop doctrine from them, make themselves feel superior, and it's all downhill from there. But the point here is that it would seem to me that Acts 2 affirms the continuation of prophecies right through the church age. And I say right through the church age because the other signs Joel mentions in that same quote are yet to happen. So he talks about stuff like sun turning to darkness and the moon to blood and, and all that. So this prophecy spans the whole period between Jesus' first and second comings. So that's why I believe it fits in there nicely. Now... This, I believe, helps us make sense of that tricky verse we looked at earlier in the series. So the the classic secessionist verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. I'll bring that up again. And I've broken it down into the parts again to make it obvious. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Now, if you've got good memories and you were here, and when we looked at this, you may recall that I pointed out that the grammar there highlights a difference in the way and the time that prophecies and knowledge will cease compared to tongues. And you can see the ESV there represents that um, the prophecies and knowledge are said to pass away, whereas in contrast tongues were to cease. So they're different Greek words in those two cases. And I concluded at that time that knowledge and prophecies are to end at the establishment of Jesus' reign on earth because notice it's referring to prophecies the utterances, the things that are actually said, not prophets as an office, as a role. That's a different thing. But the gift of tongues would cease at a different time. And I think we can see now what I would conclude then is that tongues, at least as a resident gift in a person to use at any time, ceased with the conclusion of the era of the apostles and prophets. Because tongues were specifically listed as one of the apostolic sign gifts in Mark 16. And it's the same thing with authoritative prophecy. That finished with the end of the prophets too. But with tongues, does that mean that no one can ever speak in tongues now? No, I don't believe the Bible teaches that. While these specific gifts ceased as sign gifts for the apostles and their direct converts, that's not to say that God can't or won't ever empower people with such gifts when it suits his purpose. Temporarily. Uh, For example, there are several stories of missionaries who on occasion have been given the supernatural ability to speak the native language when they arrive somewhere and the people never heard the gospel. So they are anecdotal, but there's several of them, so um, there may be some truth to that. And and now we don't, like I said, we don't know the the full truth of those stories, but who's to say that God won't do that? I don't think, we we can't say from that from Scripture. We can say from Scripture, I believe, that no one permanently carries the sign gifts of God's approval anymore. But we can't say from Scripture that he never allows people in certain places at certain times to do such a thing if it's his will. And I I will say it's the same thing for healings, with prophecies, and with the exorcisms of demons. I think these things are still possible today. But they are rare and happen entirely in accordance with the will and action of the Holy Spirit. They're not things for individuals to parade around as something that they can be, that can be dispensed at their own will, and especially not for their own glory or profit. So, okay, hopefully you at least understand where I'm coming from now. It's taken me the whole series to work this out for myself, but I think it's a reasonable position to take ultimately because it's what I think the Scripture teaches when you put everything together or everything that you possibly can put together. But I hope you can also see that it matches what we see in history and what we experience as a worldwide church 
right through to the 21st century. So you had that cluster at the beginning and then just little anecdotal ones all the rest of the way through. So as I finish up now, what about the practical implications of what I've said? So let's just have a look at a couple of quick scenarios to see what this understanding means in these contexts. So say, for example, one of you stood up this morning and you said you have a prophecy from God for our church. Okay, that's happened in churches. Well, some would say, yeah, go, yeah, go for it, brother, say it, sister, speak right then and there. It must be from God. But I hope you can see that I think that would be lacking in discernment just to, to do that. But others might say, no, sit down and be quiet. God doesn't speak that way anymore and write it off. So they're kind of the two extremes of how you could deal with it. But what I think we should do, and what I think I would do if it happened, was to say, okay, thanks, but just keep it to yourself for now, and Evan and I will talk to you afterwards, and we'll weigh up whether the prophecy is in line with Scripture, and we'll go from there. So in other words, discern it first. What are you going to say, Jonathan? Talk to me afterwards. That's right. You just want to test me out see what I'd do. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do the, do exactly that after the service. Yep. No worries. There you go. Practical application. Right then. So, now obviously if it's a matter of urgency. Like someone says, they have a revelation that the church is going to collapse or something. We might react a bit differently, but you know this, that would be the norm. Okay. So another scenario. What if someone comes up to you and tells you that you need to speak in tongues because it will take your faith to another level? What should we say to that? Because who doesn't want to lift the bar in their faith? That's, that's a good thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. But is this the way it happens? No. Because this is a Gnostic idea that there are some who are the poor losers who don't have special knowledge. And then there are some superior illuminated folks who have gained elite knowledge or some ability. That's what this can be used as. And it creates division, not unity. So that's that's just using the 1 Corinthians 14 argument of um, unity in the church. But from what we've seen today, we should say, no, I appreciate your concern for my spiritual well-being, but the kind of tongues you're referring to, firstly, may not be genuine tongues. Okay, we've talked about the two kinds. But even if they are genuine, they had a unique place as a sign in the apostolic age. And we no longer need it for that purpose. If God wants to give me the gift of tongues, it will be by his will at a time when other people need it to understand the gospel, not by my rustling up enough faith to make myself feel better. So we point out their purpose, I think, is the way we would describe that. Okay, final scenario. What about praying for healing for someone? And We've had another example of that. So say someone in your... Okay, when we say praying for healing, I guess we're talking about supernatural healing, instantaneous, that kind of thing. So say someone in your family is dying of cancer. And that's obviously something that many of us have been through, myself included, with my dad. And of course, then we have Diana and David as current examples of people who are sick or were sick. Uh, What does the Bible say about that, about praying for healing for someone? So the world would say... Put all your faith in the expensive medical system. Or other parts of the world may say crystals and yoga and meditation. (laughs) And just believe. Whatever that means. You just believe. And there are others who would say that God wants everyone always healthy and wealthy. And that if you're not, it's because someone lacks faith. And if you pray with enough faith, God will be obliged to heal. And there are countless people who have had their faith rocked by that kind of teaching, and if not destroyed. But from what we've seen this morning, I believe the best course of action is to trust God in all things. I mean, that applies to everything, doesn't it? But, um, but we trust God in all things, and we pray without ceasing for the person to be restored to full health. Without ceasing means continually, not at every second of the day, but keep, keep being, you know, ask. Ask and will be given. So I pray that they'll be restored to full health for God's glory. But still making use of the resources that God has put at our disposal to heal through the incredible medical services that we have in our society. And yes, there's plenty wrong with that system too. But 
still there are things we can do with technology these days that were certainly science fiction just a few years ago. And so as they say, work as if everything depends on you, but pray as if everything depends on God. Because the, the latter part is the most true, of course. So we can say, pray hard, but still use the resources God's provided. Don't ignore medical resources. Keeping in mind that it may, be, it may not be God's will to heal in this life. It may be his good will. But it always is will to heal in the next. That's actually something just coming here, that struck me with, if you've seen the movie The Green Mile, um, how he lived and lived and lived and lived and lived. And he actually was in pain because all, everyone he knew were kept dying and dying and dying. This actually can be a gift sometimes to eventually, you know, well, we know where we're going, so that's part of the gift as well, that we're going to a better place too. So, so it's not always God's will to, will to heal in this life, but it's always his will to heal in the next life. So thanks for lending me your ears today. I know probably not everything I've said will gel with what you you believe, but I hope we all have been challenged together to look at the work of the Holy Spirit more closely and get a closer eye on what the Bible teaches. So let's allow that anointing of the Holy Spirit, so trying to bring a few of these ideas to summarise them together, so that anointing of the Holy Spirit that's on all of us who believe to increasingly fill the rooms of our hearts and lives, like the fireplace analogy or analogy I gave earlier in the series and may his heat and light show us the way energize us to faith and good works and I pray we become more willing vessels of the Holy Spirit's work to shine a light on Jesus God's son and to build his body the church are the two things isn't it? So, let's pray Lord thanks for the challenge your word always brings to us and Lord may in, in the things I've said may your truth be known and please impress on everyone here something to take for the, for the journey. And um, yeah, we thank you that you do indwell us by your Holy Spirit. You gave us your Son, and we one day will see you. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.